Well, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming on this summer Monday. I know um, uh, we uh, it's it's a big ask to be here in the summer when we really appreciate folks coming. Uh, so welcome to the Pervade uh, in conversation with Dr. Amanda Lynn Pallotta. Uh, I'm Katie Shilton, and I'm the principal investigator of the Pervade Project. Uh, the Pervade Project is a six institution research project focused on answering empirical questions in data ethics. It's funded by the US National Science Foundation, and we're studying how people react to their pervasive digital data being used in research, how data scientists are grappling with ethics um, and ethics, ethical questions in their work, and how regulators such as university institutional review boards are guiding data intensive research. And this webinar series um, held uh, over the summer is uh, meant to highlight a number of researchers who are doing cutting edge work in data science and data ethics. And today I'm joined by Dr. Amanda Lynn Pallotta. Uh, she's the National Library of Medicine postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And her doctoral work completed in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Washington focused on the societal impacts of natural language processing technologies. So Amanda Lynn, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, we wanted to talk to you today because of your work investigating how data sets are used in machine learning research. Uh, and in particular, you've looked at how data sets are taken from one context to train models in another, and how a relatively small set of benchmarks have been valorized um, as appropriately measuring progress in machine learning. Can you tell me a bit about how you got into questions of potentially questionable data use within machine learning? Um. Yeah, so over the course of my PhD, um, I had a lot of sort of hands-on experiences trying to get data for a particular research question and just kind of experiencing firsthand how difficult it is to get quality data. And once you have it to kind of like quality check it, uh, it it's hard. And then I think simultaneously, there were a lot of, um, sort of watershed moments in natural language processing where a lot of these um, now ubiquitous large language models were kind of crushing existing language understanding benchmarks. And I think um, just out of curiosity, I was like kind of manually inspecting a lot of the language problems that these models were doing so well at. And I think I had a lot of, um, I guess, curiosity around like what like, how is it that, you know, a pair of sentences can embody a particular language understanding task? Like, what is it that the models are actually doing? And also being sort of surprised at some of the quality issues within these data sets. Like there would be, a, you know, a sentence pair that ostensibly represents like an entailment relationship, but that even I as like a human English speaker was like, I'm not really sure I could even get this one right. And so, yeah, I think just kind of like, um, for me, observing the sort of um, ostensible progress, but then kind of looking at like, what is actually, you know, the foundation for all of this progress. Um, and I think around that time, I guess this was like 2018, there were a lot of papers coming out with like data set audits that kind of pointed out the quality issues in both image and language data sets, and a lot of the um, ways in which models were sort of exploiting spurious cues in data. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I guess kind of, I just kind of started trying to keep track of like, what are all of the issues with data sets that lead them to be less than ideal sort of benchmarks for progress? So yeah, that's, that's kind of how that got started. That's oh, that, it makes a lot of sense, like coming from your own experience and then coalescing with sort of a moment in which these questions were becoming really important to the larger field. Um, so you've then since having these questions done a lot of work on thinking through choosing data sets wisely. Um, and I wonder now that you're on the sort of other side of your dissertation and you've done all of this research on the problems um, around data set use and machine learning, how do you recommend when people ask you for advice or if people, when people ask you for your advice, you know, what, how do you recommend that people developing machine learning systems choose their data sets? What is sort of, what factors should they consider? What does good data use look like? I think um, I always feel very humbled if people ask me that question because I'm like, I also don't know. I'm still kind of learning. But um, I think people tend to have the right idea around just looking for what is available and what is documented. Like, I think it's if you want to be able to train a system that you are able to understand 
um, in you know deploying a new context or if you want to be able to do you know critical error analyses you want to know what is in the training data and what are its properties and i think um, like making use of available documentation or um, available tools that let you explore the data manually um, to see like what are the properties of the data set like what are some of the what like what's the distribution of the labels or of the kind of features in there like i think that is just kind of good practice in general and I think people should keep doing that. Um, but yeah, I think, like I said, from my own experience, it's really hard to just find quality data in large amounts for particular research questions. Like there are increasingly resources like Hugging Face data sets that provide a really neat interface to both documentation and the data itself. But um, if there's a problem you're trying to solve and it's not you know, realized in one of those data sets, it's, you kind of have to either start from scratch or get clever. And I think people are willing to take a lot more shortcuts in those situations because it's like, I just want to build the thing. Um, I don't have a lot of time and I'm under this pressure to publish or to deploy something. And I think those are where it gets tricky because like, I think people are willing to sacrifice quality in those situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where you start to get spurious results and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so, so documentation actually is really interesting as a piece of this puzzle because, you know, and you mentioned that as, as fairly critical, right? You, you want well-documented data so that you understand what's happening and, and what's doc, you know, what is in this data, right? Um, and documenting data, as we know from like sort of years of studying scientists who have produced data forever and then have only sort of documented it, right? You know, because it, it's, it's extra labor, right? Like, so documenting data is sort of nobody's job frequently and it's not a super desirable it's you know it's kind of in the way of getting to your your findings or your next you know step along the path um and so you know yeah years of studying scientists have said people don't like documenting their data it's very hard to make them do it it's very hard and but like what what incentives do you think the folks creating data sets that are being utilized heavily in machine learning have for documenting that data or how might we encourage them to do it more and better <laughs> Yeah, it's something that I think about a lot because I think having looked at like data sheets that people have put out, like a lot of times there's really unsatisfactory answers to some of the questions. Like it's nice that they are being prompted to go through and reflect on these things, but you can kind of tell where some people were like, I don't have a good answer for this, or I'm just going to like kind of wing it. And so there's documentation, but it might not be quality documentation, or it might just be that like some questions they couldn't answer themselves. And so, yeah, I think. I mean, I guess there's been pushes for reproducibility as being part of um, a checklist for submitting papers to conferences. Um, and I think it's just good practice for your own work. If you wanna be able to reproduce your own results, you wanna kind of remember what you were working with. But um, yeah, I think there's also um, like creating a role within a team for the data documenter could be an interesting move. Like if that were like a paid research assistant position for somebody on a research team, or um, if companies established a data documentation role. Um, and I feel like I've seen that sort of thing coming up more, but yeah, I think really making it so that there's a person who is not burdened with other stuff can kind of really dedicate their resources and efforts to it. But um, I don't know if that's like a perfect solution, but yeah. Yeah, I so I just read a really interesting article by um, Katie Pine, who's a professor at Arizona State, who's working in the health field, so a pretty different field. But she was she was observing um, a new profession of people uh, uh, who are tasked with data documentation in hospital systems and in health systems, mm -hmm. um, because the incentives are there for hospitals to document their data well, um, because of the needs of billing and you know how complicated that is in the United States. And so there so there's a there's a new profession emerging of of, of mm -hmm. sort of per, uh, data professionals, but but, you know, as her paper was pointing out, they document the data in particular ways that are basically tailored for billing, not for research, right? Mm -hmm. Not for research or accountability um, in, in sort of health outcomes. And so because that primary driver there is the need to be able to figure out how much money the hospital, you know, it needs to like is making. And so I, I was thinking about what the analogs might be in you know, natural language processing or other sort of data documentation spaces where we have this real need for good data data documentation. But like thinking about, well, if we did have people on teams doing this, what would their 
incentives be and, and how would that impact how the data is, you know, is understood, right? Like I think certain things are documented and not others. And um, it's a really interesting question, like to sort of think through like what, what would the outcomes be of, of aligning the incentives in various ways, right? Or having um, people's job be making good data, <laughs> right? Usable, shareable data. Um, how do we, yeah, I would, anyway, it was, I think it's really worth thinking about and it's, um, it's an exciting set of things to consider. Um, you've talked a little bit, but I wondered if you could tell me a little bit more about uh, what's particularly hard or challenging about data practices um, within machine learning. You've mentioned just the difficulty of finding good data as a major challenge. Are there other sort of challenges to, to practicing good ethical machine learning? Um. Yeah, a lot. Um, <laughs> I guess with respect to data practices, another thing that's come up recently is that um, once, you know, I guess like there's this cycle lately of um, there's a large data set that wasn't very carefully curated and then somebody audits it and finds a lot of disturbing or unexpected contents in it. And then perhaps the data set becomes retired. And then people who still have copies of that data set somewhere might not know about this and might still have it or they might know and still fail to delete and get rid of the data and so i think it's very hard once a data set has been collected to make sure that it's gone forever um, if you want to get rid of it um, and um i think there's a paper by pong at all that talks about the sort of issues with retiring data sets and um so there's sort zombie of like, data sets out there yeah. in the world <laughs> um oh, that's fascinating yeah, I, I like um, sort of as a joke, but also as like a potentially earnest idea. I've thought about like, what if we created like a file format that expired over time so that it's just sort of like withered away, kind of like real documents, kind of, if you don't preserve yes. them well, they just kind of wither away, but I don't know if right. that's practical. Um, but yeah. I, mean, I think that even just the questions that would go into, you know, thinking like, for instance, when you are creating data, thinking about the lifetimes of that data is not necessarily a question that one asks themselves now, right? Um, like how long should this data exist? Should this, because, you know, some data sets we need, we'll need in a hundred years, you know, weather data and um, maybe traffic data. I think, right, you know, we'll, we'll want to know that because we'll need the, that longitudinal data or, you know, archivists will want it, historians will want it, right? Um, and some data, maybe not, right? And like, so what is the, yes. And, and, and so I actually think there are really hard questions here about how long should data live? <laughs> And that yeah. that having some sort of mechanism that that asks people to ask those questions, right? To to consider like, is this long lived data that you are producing, or is this like, should this go away? <laughs> right? It's a really a really good and interesting both philosophical and ethical question to sort of ask of data creators. Yeah, um, one of my first like experiences in language technology was an internship with the Panlex project, which is part of the Long Now Foundation. And their whole philosophy is around like trying to ensure that aspects of human culture are preserved for very, very long amounts of time. And so um, I think with respect to like language data and preservation, that was kind of their MO. But yeah, I think there's even that could potentially cause you know, ethical quandaries around like what, it, like who gets to preserve linguistic resources and for whom and for what purpose. And then, yeah, with things like, you know, photos of people or like data about people that they would rather keep private. Yeah, that I think there's maybe more of a, like a personal kind of aspect to it. Like, is my face on somebody's laptop somewhere, just like sitting there in a data set with features of myself that I didn't realize they knew about me? Like, I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, it's it's true. It's interesting thinking about the differences between sort of my utterances, right, and, and modes of speaking online um, versus, right, my face or um, other sort of attributes about me and like how, yeah, I mean, one of, there's, so you've, I know you've, you've talked and thought about privacy in your work. How do, do concepts of privacy apply to sort of linguistic data or ling uses of, of linguistic data? Um, is what we say, <laughs> you know, like I, so linguistics is not my area. So I'm, I'm very interested in sort of how you think about privacy as a piece of this puzzle, if at all. Um, yeah, I guess that for me raises two things. One is that um, I think, you know, considering a lot of the history of like mostly, like, I guess with respect to like a lot of 
linguistic documentation of indigenous languages in the Americas, a lot of that um, data was collected by like universities or you know settler researchers who then become like the sole owners of this really rich documentation. Um, there was an article in the New Yorker last year about um, the Penobscot language and how like one white guy in Maine had basically all of the archives and the tribe themselves were trying to revitalize their language and they're like, can we have that back? Um, and so, yeah, I think um, that kind of question of like, you can't really own a language, but you could have a lot of the important documentation and like, you know, grammatical information or like collections of stories or myths or things that um, in a way becomes a resource that maybe you can own or keep private or like restrict who you give it to. But yeah, that I think it's a question that I'm also kind of still thinking about. Like if, even if you have like a small snapshot of a language, can you still extrapolate enough of the grammatical properties to then say, okay, I can build a translation system for this or I can, you know, build a parser for this. Um, and then the other thing with like language and privacy, like I think I've talked about this before with a lot of people is that um, there's a lot of like scraped blog data that lives in various language training data sets. Cause I think um, when you're trying to collect a lot of kind of casual speech, I think blogs seem very irresistible. And I'm pretty sure that one of my like middle school blogs made it into one of these data sets. And that's very humiliating to me. Like, I yes. don't think that it's actually connectable back to me, but like the idea that all of my like angsty musings are in someone's like <laughs> language model, I'm just like, oh, I can't, <laughs> how do I get that back? I don't think I can, but. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> that goes back to this question of sort of longevity too, of like these, right? Like how long data should live from our sort of childhood selves and middle school selves and, and uh, right? And if they become part of these larger models, they may be around forever, but that was not our intention when we were middle schoolers writing those blocks, right? Like that we, you were not imagining this would be a resource about you forever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there's that sort of like, there's like obviously like anthropological interest to it. But yeah, while while I am still alive and, you know, still building a career, I don't want anyone to know, you know, what I was thinking about in 2003 or whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, as well, I think this gets to something that has been really important in our pervades discussions. That was sort of one of our sort of key findings has been that frequently when we say privacy, actually what we mean is power, right? And that um, around this kind of data and that power and justice are really key concerns for people whose data is being used in research, right? Um, and whether that's language data or other forms of data. Um, and also that power and justice are key concerns for many of the researchers who are gathering and using pervasive forms of data, right? You, that we talk to researchers like you all the time who are sort of trying to parse this out. Um, you know, like do, you know, can I use this data, right? And that's like a power question and a justice question question. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how you think about power and justice in your work? Um, yeah, it's hard to come up with like a concise way to think about or like to kind of verbalize this. I think um, even though there are a lot of really thoughtful frameworks for trying to do like co-design and participatory design, I still think um, like a small group of informants still doesn't necessarily speak for the entire, you know, set of people that they're meant to represent. I think every individual has such a unique way of interacting with these systems that I don't think you can just check off, oh, we did this sort of consulting with people and now we're okay. Um, so yeah, I think the people who are aware of you know, the people who are able to build and implement the systems and kind of ask the research questions hold a lot of the power. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess another aspect to that question, um, I think is informed by a lot of like my own, um, like interest, I guess, activism in like, what are the material conditions affecting people in my, current context like I try to give a lot of time to like mutual aid for like food and housing insecurity and also like immigration where I live here in Seattle and I think like all of my kind of reading of developments in the tech world is very shaped by like how is this going to impact people who aren't necessarily you know in the rooms at these tech companies 
asking the research questions or like making the decisions around what kind of data to collect and where and how. And like, I think, um, I think there's a lot of really well-intentioned people who, you know, want to build tools that work for everybody, but don't necessarily know, like in practice, a lot of technology is being used to uphold oppression and not to like alleviate difficult conditions for people. So that's like a thing that I'm currently grappling with and still figuring out how to deal with in a way that I think is sustainable and like honors what I think is right. But yeah, I felt like that was kind of a convoluted answer. No, I, I think that's, I think that's helpful. I think, you know, one of the key things we can do as researchers is tie our sort of it's not theoretical, but you know, like the work we're doing every day in our sunny academic bubbles to work we do in other parts of our lives um, as activists or as um, as parents or as you know, like all of the other sort of hats that we wear, mm -hmm. um, and or as you know, as children, as as people who may or may not be able-bodied, as people, you know, like we need to bring those hats to our academic bubbles, and like I, I because I help, I think they help us spot spot issues, spot. Um, you know, injustices, spot potential ways our texts, the, the things that we're, we're building can be used and um, uh, to perpetuate injustices. So I, yeah, I think I, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually think that that sort of multiple identities, like, you know, there was a long time in which science was supposed to be done without any identity and that's, that, that's done, right? Like we're, we're past that now, which is good. <laughs> and so like, why not bring those like, like as a part of our toolkit to, to sort of spot like, um, things we could be doing differently or better and within tech development. Yeah, and I think a lot of like the work in sort of capital letters just can't happen in academia just by the virtue of what it is and how it operates in the world. Like I think, yeah, I'm glad that we are able to bring our concerns and identities to the space, but I do think that also sometimes a lot of the work really just is meant to happen elsewhere and happens better there. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. That. That. Right. Building new language technologies isn't necessarily going to solve uh, these other problems. Right. And so, yeah, that's right. And so we need to spend our time there as well. Right. In other contexts. Agreed. Um, another sort of challenging thing for the the parade's been grappling with, and I wanted to ask you about because I think it's particularly challenging for in sort of large language sets is the idea. So one of the things that Pervade has been finding um, is that online participants, people who are participating online in various ways, still see consent as the gold standard for their data to be used in research. Um, but of course, consent is not practical and feasible in many kinds of research done with uh, online data and uh, digital data these days. Um, but what we've been finding is that forms of awareness may be like the next best, next best option, right? Uh, to, you know, people still still would like to be asked for consent, but it's not always practical. It's not always possible. Uh, but that, you know, make, helping people be aware of, of large forms of data collection is, is a piece of this puzzle. And I wondered how you think about awareness and consent to language data collection. Do you think people are aware of the extent to which say their blog posts may be used uh, in machine learning development? Are there ways we could make people more aware? Yeah, I'll say, um, I think um, Casey Fiesler has a lot of interesting work on these questions. And then, yeah, in terms of like awareness, I think anecdotally, I think everybody who uses social media on some level has experienced like really eerily on point recommendations or ads. And so I think we all have this passive awareness that something is happening behind the scenes. They're collecting something about me. Um, and it may not be as cut and dry as like the microphone is on and they're recording my conversations. There's just these like massive networks of data brokers all working together or not necessarily together, but like collecting all of this data at such a scale that like they don't even need to have the microphone on. Like they can just kind of like use all this data to infer all these things about you and your network. And so I think people have some passive awareness that something's going on. And I think like when, you know, these big headlines come came out about like Cambridge Analytica and those, you know, things, I think that really raised more awareness around like every time you use your phone, something is going on behind the scenes. Um, the thing that kind of concerns me is that it's become so normalized that I think younger people have become kind of resigned to this notion that if I want to talk to my friends, I have to just give up some of my data. Like there's, you know, terms and agreements and whatnot, and people just kind of like don't want to feel burdened by reading all of it. Or they'll say like, you know, yeah, yeah, I just want to be able to talk to my friends, like I, take my data if you have to. But um, yeah, I guess it sort of concerns me that I think people have become more resigned to it and 
I think the narrative, I think like to the extent that like tech companies can kind of like shape that narrative, they're kind of saying like, oh, we're giving you connection to your family in exchange for this. Like we're providing something that allows you to build relationships with people. And I think people kind of want to believe that. And so even if they are kind of aware or like passively consenting to having their data collected, they're like, I just want to be able to talk to my cousin on a different continent. Like, I don't know if I have to do, if I have to sacrifice my privacy for that, then I'm willing to do it. And I think that's, yeah, in a way it makes me kind of sad, but also like, I don't really know. I guess that's more of like a, a policy question that um, can be kind of addressed with um, like shaping laws or policies at like a more national level, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is increasing interest, interestingly, um, right now for policy that would, I mean, obviously there's sort of privacy policy in the works um, sort of in Congress and also at the state level, but then also interest, I've been really interested in um, several pieces of proposed le legislation which are, are talking about uh, creating archives of specifically social media data. So not necessarily blogs, although how one defines social media is actually a big mm. question, right? Um, here, like what, what's the line, right? Are dating apps, blogs, like a, maybe not, but maybe. Um, and so creating these repositories that would be accessible by researchers, uh, partially because researchers are seen as having sort of a disadvantage in terms of data access to, you know, uh, online data, right? These companies have much more access to language data and image data and all kinds of them than researchers do, um, but also to sort of keep companies accountable. I, that's why this is being explored as a as a, a legal option. You know, we can understand better how their advertising um, algorithms work, and you know, so it would be. But um, you know, the making research data more available to researchers, I think, comes with all kinds of questions about, uh, you know, did, is this what people signed up for, right? Like, did they, did they know that we would be making this available? Who gets to keep all of this data, right? Like, so there are a lot of logistical questions, but it strikes me that for somebody like you, who's interested in data documentation, you know, good data documentation and good data practices, that a professionalized model for holding on to so much of this data would actually be really positive, right? If we can imagine an archive with archival practices around documenting data that comes in and like understanding what's here, um, that it could be a sort of a moment to professionalize like good data practices. Um, so it, it seems like an interesting possibility. It's hard to tell if it will happen. It's hard to tell what kinds of resources would be available for it, but um, it's interesting to imagine a, like an archive of, of social media data for researchers and what that would look like and what that would enable. Yeah, I mean, I think people like having themselves reflected back in a way that they felt they've opted into. Like, I don't know if you've done like Spotify Unwrapped, but people love that. Yes. They're like, oh, yes. like I've generated this massive stream of data about myself and now I can at the end of the year reflect on like, what my musical personality is. So I think people like, I mean, when they feel like they can like opt into it and like share it with friends in a way that's like fun and whimsical, I think like, like if there was like a museum of social media that kind of like showcased interesting moments that were anonymized, I think people would actually like that, but I'm sure people would also feel somewhat uncomfortable if they recognize themselves or if they were like, you know, these are really intimate moments that have happened incidentally like on Facebook but that like I feel sort of like of why you're reading it but um yeah that kind of reminds me like I used to when I was in high school I used to like find notes left behind from people who would pass notes in class and like I would be like what were they talking about and I would like you know not know who they were from but yeah I feel like that happens less now that people just kind of text each other but if you were able to kind of like see an anonymized conversation that happened over text it's kind of like a I don't know I think people find it cute when you can kind of see like how relatable other people are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, right. Yeah, I mean, you can see just like the academic potential for it, the machine learning potential for something like this is, is huge, I think. Um, yeah, it's a good point. I like your point about people seeing their data reflected back to them. I actually think that this is a part of the awareness puzzle too, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's this some of we're getting some of our digital selves reflected back to us through the advertising and through you know the, the like targeting of ads but we're getting there are other mechanisms for reflecting back and i think about all right like a chat bot that sounds like me right or that like <laughs> sounds like somebody i know or you know like that um kind of like reflecting back is another 
just a nice piece of like how we can help build awareness of like how these systems work and what they're using and like the kinds of data that are contributing um, that the outputs of these systems are, are a piece of that puzzle. Um, let's turn a little bit to method um, in your research and and specifically how you how you found um, you can turn sort of reflection on power or awareness or um, good data practices into research methods in your work. Like, how do you incorporate those practices? Um, so that's definitely something I'm still figuring out. I think um, a lot of methods that I've kind of stumbled on were not necessarily available to me through my disciplinary training and were things that I kind of stumbled on through taking a seminar or going to a talk and incidentally being like, oh, there's this whole body of literature that I just never was introduced to formally. And so I feel like I've been kind of trying to teach myself a lot of things and I feel a lot of, um, uh, I guess, I don't know what the right word to use is here, but I feel sort of like a dilettante if that's the right way to say that, where I think I've been trying to engage more with like, HCI methods and more with um, like STS practices and methods and like uh, I feel like a lot of it has been me just kind of asking around people or taking a class here or there um, but not really feeling like I'm doing it right um, <laughs> yeah I think I mean, as somebody yeah. trained in STS methods I'm constantly feeling like I'm not doing it right <laughs> I think that's normal <laughs> but I know yeah what you mean. and I guess maybe that's kind of part of it too is that like we're sort of naturally trying to reflect as we try these things out. Like I think people who are inclined towards such methods are naturally going to be kind of self-reflexive people who are even like, yeah, questioning like, am I doing this right? Like, how can I continue to evolve along these lines? Um, so yeah, that's definitely something I'm still figuring out. I think um, among the frameworks I've tried to read about in my sort of limited understanding, like I think Design justice has been one of the few that really tries to call out explicitly um, the, I guess the term they use is the matrix of oppression as something that we want to design against. I think there's kind of this like spectrum of like frameworks that are a little bit more flexible or a little bit more kind of not prescriptive. And then there's others that are like, these are, you know, really there are material conditions in the world that exist because of history and we can explicitly call them out and design against them. And so, yeah, it's, I'm trying to kind of like figure out in the spectrum of different frameworks and ways of thinking about things, like what can I use in my own work and to what extent? Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's really fascinating and useful. So I, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about different design frameworks come out of HCI, like value sensitive design, which sort of, you know, is a, a very, uh, how would I characterize it? You know, it's about the value, like, you know, everybody has values and we, we look at a community and then we try and figure out, um, and then contrasting that against something like design justice, right? Which is about like, no, no, it's, it's not necessarily about what the group of people you're talking to want, but is this, right, there's this like historical and material conditions and that's what we're trying to, to grapple with in our design practice. Um, and, you know, you can see the relationship between these two frameworks, but they're actually quite different, I think, right? And how you would apply them as method. Um, and, and then, and then I think as we get to learning technologies, there's like a third question which comes up about like, well, how do we know it's work? You know, like, how do we mm -hmm. then translate values and or politics to outcomes and to benchmarks to outcomes to like, because I think the thinking about the design of learning, like we've had 30 years of thinking about the design of sort of interface technologies through HCI lenses, but we haven't had that like 30 years of learning technologies and they're and they're different right like they their design practices are different for these technologies and also like sort of what we can like the outcomes and outputs are different and so like trying to figure out how to translate some of those practices um, in ways that make sense for learning technologies is I think a really interesting project and like one that I'm excited that people like you are working on <laughs> so I like like seeing sort of how that's happening do you have a sense of where the sort of the state of norms or agreement about best practices for data ethics in uh, language learning communities? Like, do you, do you have a sense of an emerging consensus? Um, so I think my collaborators, Emily Bender and Angie McMillan Major have done a lot of work on like establishing and iterating on data statements specifically for natural language processing. And I think the community 
has like really benefited from this work. And I think I'm increasingly seeing people trying to engage with best practices for documenting language data and language models and um, kind of like, it's interesting. Like, I think because it's relatively new within the field to have such a resource, like, I think there's a lot of learning underway of like, how do people respond to this? both the practice of creating documentation and the practice of receiving documentation. And like I mentioned earlier, like I think having looked at various examples of data statements, like there's some that just kind of seem to be, you know, winging it on some of the questions or like not really sure how to answer a question or just kind of like, um, yeah. And I think anecdotally, I think people, have stuff that they do want to report, but there isn't like a neat space within the statement to add that. And so, yeah, I think it's interesting to see like, how can this resource evolve over time, the more people actually use it and try to put it into practice. Um, and yeah, I guess the other thing, um, I think maybe because of where I am both institutionally and like just in my sort of social networks, like I think because of like who I collaborate with and being at University of Washington, like I think there's a lot more kind of cross pollination and like acceptance of these new practices or relatively new practices. But I think um, I'm curious, like, you know, within the global language technology community, like how, like, how are people receiving these new, or not new, but these practices are like, are people receptive to it or are there different ideas around what is ethical or what is important to surface with respects to data documentation. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, maybe my perspective is limited and it is limited. Um, <laughs> so yeah. And I guess like another thing, um, so now that I'm in the school of medicine working with more health informatics people, like I'm kind of learning more about like, like within the US medicine has a little bit more history of trying to establish research ethics guidelines and seeing how that community talks about things versus how like language technology and machine learning talk about things. There's a lot of kind of ways in which I think machine learning is kind of stumbling along the, a similar path where there has been work done before. Um, and again, maybe this could be my limited perspective on like what conversations are happening, but I feel like there's a lot of potential for like machine learning to learn from some of the uh, the difficulties faced by the medical community and trying to like grapple with its own history of racism and exploitation. And like they, I think the medical community obviously is still dealing with a lot of ethical issues, but has had, I guess, maybe a 40 year head start on trying to establish more norms around research practice and ethics. So yeah, that's something I'm kind of learning about too. Oh yeah, that's really interesting. That's very interesting. Um, I wanted to just note for participants, you are welcome at any point to uh, use the Q&A box to ask questions and I will make sure they get asked. Um, I, can you think of resources that might make this process that you're identifying of sort of, you know, getting a, a jump on, on, uh, on identifying best practices, coming to consensus around best practices easier for machine learning uh, practitioners and researchers? Um. Yeah, I guess, do you mean resources for like how to start tackling ethical questions or like resources for putting into practice some of these? Oh, either would be great to, okay. to hear about if there's, yeah, one or the other strikes you. Yeah, as... I think, I guess everyone kind of learns differently. I find that I get a lot out of like reading journalism and reading books. Um, like I think, um, in terms of like kind of learning from the history of like medicine and medical anthropology, um, reading about like Henrietta Lacks and her cell line becoming this like really widely used resource without her or her family having known. Like I think looking at that history and like what shaped it and what its impact was, I think, and then trying to draw analogies to like how we're using research subjects and data in machine learning, I think could be a really productive avenue for like thinking through, okay, like what can we learn from this? Um, and I guess um, in terms of like resources to support, like putting things into practice, um, 
yeah, like a taking advantage of existing documentation. Um, I guess I often plug um, work by Swabo Swayam Dipta on data set cartography, which is like a method for surfacing um, like difficult instances in machine learning training data, particularly for like natural language processing. And I think like taking advantage of, um, cause like it, it is difficult to like manually comb through an entire data set to try to document what's in it or like what are the problematic instances. And so making use of like algorithmic or statistical properties of the data can help you spotlight like, okay, here's like what the average instance kind of looks like. Here's what some edge cases might look like. Um, are there any interesting properties that maybe have to do with like linguistic facets or like, is there something in the content? But um, yeah, I think making use of tools like that can really help kind of ease the pain of trying to produce documentation from scratch. Um, but yeah. Um, it's a fantastic term. Data set cartography, it's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Um, no, th th those are great examples. That's really, I think that's really, really helpful. Um, are there sort of issues you see coming down the pipe in the data ethics and algorithmic ethics space um, that we should be talking about more or that you sort of hope to be paying attention to soon? Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, like, how we should think about our data. Um, and I think this is like a conversation that's going on in various different disciplines, but like because of how online a lot of us are just kind of by virtue of needing to be, especially with the last few years of the pandemic, like so much of our behavior is digitized and available to whoever has been collecting that data. And so I think a space that I'm interested in following right now is like theorizing like what should we call that? Or like, what can we make of those relationships? Like, are we doing labor by producing data or are we, should we be considered, I guess I've somebody told me about uh, research on considering people like shareholders in a business because our data is so valuable. And so kind of like theorizing the political economy of data is an interesting space for me lately. Like, I guess digital data, because yes. like, I think increasingly because the pandemic really like illustrated how much we can just do online like this webinar like I think there's no going back like everything is going to be increasingly online and thus more and more of our behavior is going to be digitized and I think it's urgent to kind of theorize like what are the implications of that and like what can we do to make sure that it doesn't become you know unbearable <laughs> yes yes I think that's really really important who's whose is this data who benefits from this data Yes, and, and what does a world look like in which there's a more just set of benefits that come out of this kind of interaction or the, the capture of this kind of interaction, right? Like we're getting benefits from this interaction now, but right, but there's it's also being captured in various ways that we do not have pipelines into or we don't we don't see into. So yes, who gets that? <laughs> uh, can we can we democratize it? That's a great question. Um, my last question, I want to know a little bit more about sort of what's next for you. So you have a new postdoc or new-ish postdoc, I guess. Um, what's, what are you working on? Sort of what's exciting you for your future work? Um, lately, I've been thinking a lot about kind of the intersection of language technology and healthcare. And I think where this comes up a lot in my recent like readings and connections with people is... Um, at least within the US context, um, there's a lot of linguistic and cultural barriers to healthcare for people who have limited English proficiency. And so increasingly, um, like technology is coming to play a role there where like if interpreters aren't available using translation tools. Um, and I think um, Nilufar Salehi at UC Berkeley has like a new project in the space that I'm excited to see what comes out of that. Um, and I forget, what this organization is called, but I've seen there's an organization that makes a tool that has like preloaded translations for very common phrases in the medical space so that you know that you're getting a quality, accurate translation that's been vetted by a human. Cause like, it's one of those really high stakes scenarios where you don't want a mistranslation or like a cultural insensitivity to happen. And so that's something I'm interested in like continuing to learn more about. Um, 
And yeah, um, I guess as we talked about earlier, figuring out like what's a good design framework to bring into that space that can, you know, inform how to understand like what people's needs are and like how to build tools in a way that reflects the values of the people who are going to be most impacted. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where my mind is lately. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating and valuable. That's, uh, yeah, for some language technologies in the healthcare space had not sort of that intersection hadn't occurred to me as a um, a point like of yeah and and what a useful interesting place to be thinking about data data documentation uh, how data is used practices uh, that's fascinating I love it well thank you this has been just so, super illuminating super interesting I'm really glad we got a chance to chat today and uh, thanks for being part of this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great to talk. It was a pleasure. Take care. <laughs>